Hello everybody, this is the BG, and today we're going to talk about how to make French toast. This is going to be a departure from our normal gluten-free, dairy-free discussions for breakfast items because I've spent so much time perfecting this recipe that you all deserve to see how it's done. In addition to talking about how to make French toast, I'm also going to discuss how I even got to this recipe. It is through a combination of watching different TV shows and then also by mistake. So the first thing to bring up is to talk about the bread. In this recipe, I'm gonna be using brioche. Before that, I would actually use challah bread. Both are acceptable breads to use, but I personally prefer using brioche. Let's talk equipment for a moment. First, you'll need a large sized aluminum pan, a mixing bowl, a nutmeg grinder, measuring cup, and fork, then a cutting board, a knife, along with a jelly roll pan and a wire rack for drying out the bread. And finally, a griddle and a spatula. As for the ingredients, you actually don't need much. A loaf of brioche, whole milk, eggs, salt, nutmeg, and yes, we actually add maple syrup as a main ingredient in our batter. I mean, who are you kidding? You love it. Here's our recipe so you can get a bird's eye view of where we're going. To make the best French toast that you've ever had, we have to start with the bread. So in this case, I'm going to be cutting up a loaf of brioche. What I need to do is get this bread as dry as possible. The drier the bread is, the more liquid it'll be able to absorb, and then the more custardy the inside of it will be. Before I start cutting the bread, I'm going to turn on the oven to 300 degrees Fahrenheit. I want to cut this loaf of bread into eight even slices. And you could do that by starting from the left or right side and trying to approximate getting eight even slices. But the easier method is to do what sushi chefs use to actually cut up a roll. I'm going to square off both ends because I'm the BG and then I'm gonna cut the loaf in half. And then each one of those halves, I'm gonna cut those in half to make quarters, and each one of the quarters I'm gonna cut in half to make eighths. And that way, it is way easier to get eight even slices than trying to go from one side to the other. With the bread cut up, I'm going to put it onto a cookie cooling rack on top of a jelly roll pan, and that way the bread will be elevated when it goes into the oven. I need airflow underneath the pieces of bread to dry out properly. With all the bread on the pan, it's going to go into the oven at 300 degrees. We're going to put it in for 20 minutes and then do a check on it. To make the custard, we're going to be using a ratio of one egg and one third cup of milk and then one tablespoon of maple syrup per slice of bread. So in this case, since I have eight slices of bread, my first step is to crack eight eggs into a bowl. I'm then going to add eight tablespoons of maple syrup by my precision pour method. And then after the maple syrup is in, I'm gonna add one half of a piece of nutmeg that's been grated freshly, and then a pinch of salt. To get a consistent mixture, before I add the milk to this, I am going to mix up the eggs first. It is much, much, much easier to scramble the eggs before adding milk. With the eggs mixed up, I can now add an eight times one third of a cup, which would be two and one third cups of milk. After that's been mixed in, then I'm going to whisk all that back together again and then wait for the bread to be finished. So after 20 minutes in the oven, the bread is going to be just a little bit golden. I'm going to flip it over so that the other side can start getting golden. But at this stage, it's not dried out enough yet. And so we're going to put it back in the oven for another 20 minutes. After being in the oven for now a total of 40 minutes, the bread is almost there. When I tap on it with a spoon, it has a slight bit of yield to it, and so I'm not quite happy yet. I'm going to put it in for another 10 minutes. After being in the oven for a total of 50 minutes, the bread is exactly where I want it to be. If I hit it with a spoon, it feels like I'm hitting a crouton. It's totally dried out, and this stuff is perfect. The vessel that you put the bread into to soak into is also very important. What I'm looking for is a pan that basically fits the bread perfectly in it. This large size aluminum pan is a little bit too long, so what I'm going to do is actually fold up the side of it so that I'm making a pan that is the same size as the bread is. If there is any free space around the bread, that is area that is going to be taken up by the custard, and then it's not going to rise up the edges of the bread as far, which is going to interfere with the soaking of it. So ideally, if you had a pan that was like the exact size of that bread laying in there, that's the perfect thing to have. The other thing that I'm going to mention is that when this bread goes in to be soaked by the custard mixture, it is still warm. I take it directly out of the oven, put it in the pan, and pour the custard mixture over top. So with this warm bread and a properly fitted pan, I'm going to pour my custard mixture over top, making sure that I'm covering all the bread. I'm going to let this soak for 10 minutes, and then we'll check on it. So with the bread soaking, let's talk about how we even got here. For me, I'm an iterative recipe maker. I will make something, write it down, do it, 
evaluate it, write notes on my recipe, and then change it for the next time. And I'll keep iterating like that until I get to a steady state. Making the French toast properly was actually a much longer journey than normal for most recipes I deal with because there wasn't a good way to dry out the bread effectively. If you were to watch TV in the 90s, you would see that most people would actually just leave the bread cut up and on a cooling rack the night before and just let it dry out overnight. This is not as effective as actually putting it in the oven and drying it out because having the higher temperature in the oven to drive out the moisture is a better way to dry out the bread than letting it sit at room temperature. The other thing that came about purely by accident is that the first couple years I was making this and then I figured out how to use the oven to dry out the bread, I would do it the night before and then just let it sit overnight. But there was one time I was making breakfast and I forgot to cut up the bread and dry it out the night before, so I had to do it the morning of. And I found out that it soaked up the liquid probably four times faster than it did when I dried it out the night before. You can see how mistakes that happen in cooking actually turn into something beneficial. And so it just comes down to keep trying, keep playing around with things. Sometimes the constraints of the situation actually turns into something positive. And so just keep your head up and keep cooking. At the 10 minute mark, I'm gonna look at the bread and you can actually see that it's, it's absorbed quite a bit of liquid. I'm gonna flip it over so that it'll soak another 10 minutes on the other side. After 20 minutes of soaking, the bread has basically absorbed every bit of that liquid that was in that pan. So these guys are ready to roll for the griddle. So get your favorite griddle fired up. This one, I have it set at 325 degrees. Next step is to butter the entire griddle beforehand and then make sure that the butter is fully melted and sizzling. With the butter ready to roll, now we can put all the bread onto the griddle. The last step of importance here is that since the bread is gonna be wetter on the side facing the pan, I want to actually flip over the bread when I put it onto the griddle, so that way any of the liquid that is sitting on the bottom edge of the slice is now on the top and then it'll soak down. This is a way to maximize the amount of liquid that I'm putting into this slice of bread. I'm going to let the bread cook for now five to seven minutes. You're gonna check on it to see how brown the bottom is. Once you're happy with the color, like what you're seeing here, you're going to take your stick of butter and every time you flip over a slice of the French toast, you're gonna re-butter the bottom of it and then flip it over. After the other side has cooked up for five to seven minutes, you will notice that the bread will actually expand. It'll look like, like a plump diaper at this point. What I'm going for is like a Pampers, a fully loaded Pampers diaper at this point for all the new parents out there. And that way you have the perfect French toast finished on the griddle and it is now ready to plate. So there you go. That's how you make the best French toast that I can teach you how to make. This is an exercise in just learning through mistakes and looking at as many resources as you can find to actually make a particular recipe. Enjoy it with some powdered sugar, more maple syrup, make your own whipped cream, throw some berries on it like we have. This is the BG, keeping it square. I'll see you next month. Thanks for watching today. Once upon a time, we showed you how to make Thai chickpea curry. Now it's time to show you how to make Thai chicken curry. Yeah, it's a lot of ingredients, but it's also a lot of flavor. We'll show you how to do it all. Subscribe to us, check out our website for downloadable recipes, and we'll see you next time on our final freezer. I forgot the butter and the ingredients. We're going on a dairy train that we can't stop. I'm making this video for you people and I can't even eat any of this. None of it. I've been working for years on this recipe. But I make it because I love my friends. And I, want the I was on the quest for the perfect French toast. You gotta flip because you got the soak side down. You want the soak side up. So with the bread soaking, let's talk about how we even got here.